By the sixth day, with no progress made for compromise, the SAS was deployed, rappelling down from the building's rooftop and making their forceful entry into the embassy. All right, y'all, welcome back to Common Arms Channel. Okay, so today we are checking out a video from the armchair historian. Now, we've checked out the video that they did previously with the Finnish squad versus the Soviet squad, and that was just really, really cool. Again, it's nice to have an animation, but it's really nice to have a solid animation just because you can really like picture the history a little bit better because obviously sometimes there might be a lack of pictures or you know obviously video so it's kind of cool to be able to see an animation so today we're checking out the evolution of british uniforms now i don't know a whole lot about british uniforms i mean i know like the red coats way back in uh, not even way back in the day i'm saying that because the u.s is only about that old when the when the brits were actually using the red coats and whatnot so i don't know how far this is going to go back i mean maybe not medieval times but it'd be kind of cool if they did but i'm sure it'll come up to modern times but yeah should be good so let's check it out while the British Army played a vital role in defeating the Axis, its biggest contribution was arguably breaking the Enigma Code, which let the Allies decipher German plans as if they okay. had been posted on the internet for everyone to look at. If you don't want your secrets falling into the hands <laughs> oh my of gosh, any okay. intelligence agencies, I highly recommend NordVPN. I, I like that little animation, but okay. Again, I appreciate the grind, but we'll just go ahead and blow past this. Okay. Following the acts of the Union <laughs> in 1707, a newly formed British army was established, succeeding okay. the prior English and Scottish armies and their predecessor, the New Model Army. Almost immediately, hmm. this newborn military force, equipped with doglock muskets, was thrust into battle during the War of the Spanish Succession, suffering okay. severe losses at the Fyrick victory at Malplaquet. Hmm. As it would become popularized, the red tunic of the British Army <laughs> would be cemented in its military tradition for centuries. Yeah, so this is back in the time where, like, their dress uniforms were, like, also their fighting uniforms, I think, so... I don't know whose idea it was to, I mean, first of all, getting online and sort of fighting war like that wasn't really that smart. So war has definitely evolved from that. But as far as wearing the red coats, not sure if that's the best method, but I don't think camouflage was too popular back in the day. And this is also when people wore like face paint to intimidate people and not necessarily to try and blend in. In contrast to their lower-ranked counterparts, the elite officer class brandished edged weapons as components of their status very good. and position <laughs> as leaders. This practice to carry such an item into combat would carry on for many decades into the modern era, yep. although its practical use decreased over time. <laughs> Yeah, it's Defeating the same for the, the U.S. French during the Battle of Varburg, along with their Hanoverian allies, British grenadiers during this time were equipped with brown bass muskets and okay. their peculiar grenadier caps. The brown bass <laughs> would remain in British military service for over a hundred years, with variations and improvements mm. over that period of time. Dang, that's a lot for the like East a India fire company, like that. Set up by the British as a joint stock company for trades within the region of the Indian Ocean, saw Indians being enlisted into various presidency armies. What is this dude wearing? It's like he's got like board shorts on or like swim shorts or something. <laughs> okay, so the Battle of, Battle of Buxar. Yeah, this is kind of cool because, again, it's given, like, a history of the, the Brits and what they did as far as combat. But I'm not familiar with any of these conflicts. But I don't know what that dude is wearing, but he sure looks comfortable. I'll say that. Until 1857, these formations served under the British Army across multiple campaigns, chiefly on the subcontinent, in the effort of colonial expansion. Hmm. British forces would find a there number of their own muskets being used against them during the American War for Independence. Huh. Those fighting the British Army would refer to their oppressors as bloody backs and on occasion okay. red coats in reference to their long standing yeah, uniforms. Yeah, I know red coats. Those who stayed loyal to the crown wore blue or green in contrast, although eventually they conformed to wearing the red uniforms. Huh. Grenadiers okay. continued to serve as elite specialized formations. During the War for Independence, Grenadiers would continue to be armed similarly to their line infantry counterparts, although on occasion utilizing an older, long land pattern that had been supplanted by the short land pattern. Huh. So, did the Grenadiers have like different hats? Is that kind of what we're seeing? Because it seems like the, the uniform history is a little bit different for the Grenadiers, but 
I'm not sure. It looks like the hat is kind of specific to what they were wearing. Spears were common on the battlefield, with a company being found in every line infantry battalion. They would continue hmm. to maintain their distinct status as disciplined, top-tier troops, supplemented by the increasing use and popularity of the British Grenadiers March okay. by this era. Real quick, if you guys know where the where the term grenadier came from, please put it down in the comment section because the way I picture it in the modern like military, at least in the, in the U.S. military, the grenadier is generally someone that has like a grenade launcher or something like that. So I, obviously back in the day, they didn't have that. So I'm not exactly sure where that term came in. So if you guys know, please put it down below. In Portugal, a coalition landing force led by Sir Arthur Wellesley defeated the outnumbered oh, French snap. division posted near the village of Holisa. That looks Catching slick. the nickname of the Grasshoppers, riflemen of the 95th Rifles wore a more distinctive green uniform in contrast to their red line infantrymen counterparts. Okay. Although this was a popular color choice of similarly armed formations mm. in the era, the color would become synonymous with various other British rifle formations in history. Right, this would like also see the acceptance the and issue of the British-made Baker rifle, supplanting the older smoothbore muskets. Okay. In 1814, the British Army would return <laughs> to the United States, making a drive for the White House. And they had to put the red coats back on, huh? <laughs> itself and burning it down. Line infantrymen would continue to be armed with the India pattern brown bass musket, with minor improvements in standard equipment in comparison okay. to their counterparts 40 years ago. I guess it's While symbolic. Ultimately, this was an inconclusive conflict as both the British Empire and Canada and the US withdrew from their respective front lines. The empire would continue to be engulfed in campaigns in Europe with the raging <laughs> Napoleonic Wars. The Highland soldiers okay, of the, the 42nd Regiment of Foot, Royal Highlanders, nicknamed the Black Watch, fought valiantly in the Battle of Waterloo, complete in dress with their distinctive patterned kilts. The nice. kilts originate as a traditional dress garment of Gaelic men and those in the Scottish Highlands during the 16th century, and continue to ah, be worn in certain okay. military formations to this day. With yeah, I always wonder where the kilt came from. I know it's like pretty meaningful thing for, for Scottish people. I've even seen it here in the U.S., so... I mean, it kind of carries over, so I guess it is like a, a pretty big part of the culture, or at least like the the national image or something. I don't know, national national history. So for me, it's kind of like a, a cool thing. We don't really have anything like that in the U.S. Again, our history isn't as rich, but it's kind of cool to see. If you guys are from Scotland, and if you have any like interesting stories about the kilt, or you know, maybe if you you wear in the kilt, please put that down below. Because again, it's just it's. It's interesting to me for some reason. I might have to find a video specifically about the kilt because, I don't know, it's pretty iconic, I think. The regiments claiming their own unique patterns. The British Army fought valiantly alongside their French allies Inkerman. in the chaotic battle of Inkerman in 1854. Hmm. The era saw the introduction of the rifle musket into British service with first the P-51 Manet rifle and then the P-53 Enfield rifle musket. In the oh, Crimea, snap. the majority of the British infantry were armed with the rifle musket, although around one-fifth of the infantry deployed at the beginning of the war still carried the smoothbore P-42 percussion cap musket. Hmm. By the midpoint of the war in 1855, the Army of the East, as it was known, was completely armed with the rifle musket, and the remainder of the British Army deployed at home and around the world would so soon follow suit. So it seems like they're getting suit. rid of the red coat, at with least. With a push for economic opportunities in Southeast mm. Asia, more specifically China, the British military came into conflict twice over opium and other trade disputes. Mm. While proper okay. rifles were not the main armament across the army, it had further become the standard issue weapon of the line infantrymen. Alongside their French allies, the city of Canton, that numbered in nearly a million, had been captured by a force of 6,000. I have no idea where Canton is, to be honest, but I do like how they're talking about the, the actual firearms as well, because that kind of helps. Again, I thought the musket was like way older than the 1850s, but I don't know. I, they're going to soon get into like some pretty modern weapons, so I'm sure the, the Lee Enfield... It's probably going to be coming up here Within soon. the region, the Indian Rebellion of 1857 had also taken place. Although a failed revolt, okay. this propelled the British Army to more widely adopt a simpler khaki field uniform rather than to be dressed in ornate and brightly colored garments. <laughs> Makes sense. More Although comfortable suffering too. a notable disaster at okay. Islanwana in January of that year, oh. Rourke's Drift 
fought later the same day was a hard-fought victory for the British Army. Mm. Although continuing to be clad in their traditional red and blue uniforms, they were armed with the relatively new and very effective rifle, the Martini Henry, which had oh, replaced nice. the recently adopted Snyder Enfield rifle. Although this was a time of significant tactical change in the British Army, it was found that more traditional close-order tactics were found to be most effective against the swift-moving and aggressive huh. Zulu Army. That's the 24th Regiment of Foot and Gonville Bromhead would be immortalized in their actions in the 1964 film Zulu. The traditional yeah, okay. red uniform. I really need to learn a little bit more about the Battle of Rourke Strip. I know you guys were telling me a lot about it, so I might have to try and find a, a video specifically about that. So if you guys have any recommendations, put that down below because I've heard a lot about it, but I don't know a whole lot about it had by this era become a true liability in combat. To counter this, khaki now became the authorized dress for all foreign service in the late 1890s. Huh. The Boer Wars, notably during the disastrous events of Black Week and Bloody Sunday, taught many lessons to the British Army in fieldcraft, musketry, and logistics. Huh. These lessons would be refined and would stand the British Army in good steed as it entered the Great War. The Boer War is this interesting. This also saw the introduction to the Lee family of rifles, which there would be in British military service throughout the 20th century. Dang, that thing is old then. By the start of the Great War, the bright uniforms and flashy color facings were long done away with for field service. In yeah. their place was an improvised khaki service dress that allowed the soldier to better blend in with his surroundings. The main weapon for the average rifleman was the Mark III SMLE. Nice, there the we officer go. corps wore mostly <laughs> the same khaki colored uniform as their enlisted counterparts. Okay. It was privately purchased of normally higher quality and differing in detail. In mm. addition to a traditional sword at their side, most carried the Webley Mark VI revolver. Across all nice. ranks. That's kind of cool to think about now because even in like the US military, whether it comes to kits or even like uniform items, there's a lot of like privately bought stuff that you can get. It's kind of like authorized, but you have to pay for it yourself. So it's kind of cool that they're actually doing it way back in the day as well. I wonder how old that is where you can actually, you know, decide to purchase either stuff that's better or stuff that just looks a little bit sleeker, I guess. Ranks. A simple peaked cap with a regimental badge was worn head injuries increased significantly as soldiers who would have died otherwise were now better protected from above. This steel mm. combat headgear cemented itself as part of the British soldier for several decades until the 1950s, as well as seeing use by the American Expeditionary Force and US military as a whole until relegated to civilian use in 1941. With the ferocious that. blitzkrieg across Western Europe, the British Army was pushed further and further to the coast of Dunkirk, hmm. where an evacuation of colossal scale took place. Along with the iconic yep. number one Mark III Lee Enfield rifle, the rifleman was given a new battle dress, a full wool ensemble worn by all ranks oh, with man. a distinct wool? waist cut top that influenced the Ike jacket the United States would adopt in later years. Wool is like nice for being warm and stuff, but it's not very comfortable to, to be wearing all the time. Formulated by David Sterling hey, under the name nice. L Detachment, this commando force would be used to operate behind enemy lines, not through airborne insertion, but via jeeps. Nice. During its second mission during Operation Crusader, it successfully destroyed over 60 enemy aircraft. Notably, mm. the parachute wings of this elite unit were prominently worn above their left pocket. Sterling, nice. the SAS's brainchild, stated that the wings were treated as medals in their own right. During their operations, <laughs> they adapted cool. the tropical uniform for the desert heat. Dating back to the Board of Ordnance in the 15th century, the British Royal Engineers have been responsible for all military engineering and technical functions as a combat support service nice. in the British Army as a whole. Sappers in this role would have responsibilities in fortifying defenses as well as handling mines both to plant Legends. and defuse, especially in the flat, open terrain of North Africa. That's a rough job. The Dieppe Raid, formerly known as Operation Jubilee, was an operation all too similar to what the D-Day landings would pursue two years later. The American-made Thompson submachine gun given to British commandos mm. allowed a single soldier an increase in available firepower. The commandos themselves were formed from volunteers and trained for raids within German-occupied Europe 
at the request of Winston Churchill. It should be noted that outside of the commando force, nearly 80% of troops allocated to this operation were Canadian. Unfortunately, huh. this would be a failed operation to test the metal of Hitler's Atlantic Wall. Operation Market... Dang, okay. I don't know a whole lot about Operation Jubilee either. I'm not even sure if I've... I've heard about it before, for sure, but I don't know a whole lot about it. I think I've heard about it in, you know, bits and pieces when people are talking about the commandos, but I'll have to check that out as well. But we can kind of see the uniforms are pretty much consistent throughout World War II, and that's actually what the Army moved to recently, the U.S. Army, because they kind of deviated away from that World War II look. And now they're trying to they're trying to go back to their roots. So I'll post a picture here so you guys can see what the uniform looks like versus what it actually used to look like. So it's kind of cool that they're going back to the roots. But you can see these uniforms are pretty iconic for the time. Garden became widely known as the largest yet most disastrous Allied airborne operation. Oh, Despite snap. this, the Red Devils of the British Parachute Regiment fought tooth and nail against their heavily armed enemy, which also included their German counterparts, the Fallschirmjäger. Their signature red beret and wings were the icon of the airborne force. That's By this cool. point, the Sten submachine gun had been improved with a rear sight derived from the standard bolt action rifle and a higher degree huh. of manufacturing quality. The That's Denison cool. Smogs know became upgraded. the first major widespread adoption of camouflage by the British Army mm -hmm. and would continue to be used for decades. Awesome. The British Army deployed the 27th Commonwealth Brigade during the Korean War, being made of British, Canadian, Australian, Indians who served as medics, and New Zealanders. That's awesome, A dude. uniform developed for the warmer climates was issued for troops first arriving in Korea, although a winter uniform had been made up from U.S. cold-weather gear stocks worn on huh. top of a warm jumper. Ultimately, the armament and web equipment would remain similar as it did in the previous war. That's really cool. So the, the Gloucester, I can't, I struggle so much with saying that word. Gloucestershire, Gloucestershire, I don't know. That That's like the one British word, or I, I guess it's British. That's the one word I really struggle with. But okay, so I haven't heard of that regiment. I know that they did take part in, in you know, the Korean War as far as like the, the Brits and whatnot and the Commonwealth. But cause it's very much overlooked on the US side. So I'm sure it's probably about the same in the UK, but... Yeah, it is a very fascinating war. It was definitely not a nice one. I mean, are they ever, British I guess? British Malaya would be engulfed <laughs> in a guerrilla war, just as Vietnam would be a decade later. Communist forces nice. fought for independence against the British. Ultimately successful in defeating the communists, the conflict would see the resurgence of the Special Air Service and would also nice. see troops from many parts of the Commonwealth, including Australians, New Zealanders, as well as a large contingent of Gurkhas. Oh, yeah. The tough Gurkha, and hardy man. men from Nepal had considerable experience in jungle conditions as had been found in Burma during the Second World War. These forces would be the strong backbone during this conflict. Huh. At the Iranian embassy in London, hey, six armed go. men vying for the Khuzestan province's sovereignty had taken 26 people hostage for several days. Mm -hmm. By the sixth day, with no progress made for compromise, the SAS <laughs> was deployed, repelling yes. down from the building's rooftop and making their forceful entry into the embassy. The SAS forces were equipped with nice a reliable German-made MP5 submachine gun, a popular, now iconic choice for many police <laughs> and special units. I love the flashlights that they just put on top of the MP5s. <laughs> it's just so awesome. It's not really something that, I mean, it, it looks like it's effective enough, but it's not something that a lot of people consider doing. I mean, putting a flashlight on a weapon at all, but just slapping one on top of this small firearm is just, it's funny to see. The operation overall was a resounding success and thrusted this no elite kidding. unit into the public eye for the first time. And the SAS was looked upon for expertise for counterinsurgency tactics. Hmm. April 2nd, 1982 kicked off the Falklands War. Oh, Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands and South Georgia the following day. We're seeing a In big response, jump here British now. British forces deployed a naval task force to counter the Argentinian forces and conducted an amphibious assault on the islands. The riflemen <laughs> conducting the assault were issued the L1A1 self-loading rifle, a British-made mm -hmm. licensed copy of the Belgian FN FAL. Classic. And by this point, camouflage uniforms were standard for the British Army. The conflict would end within 10 weeks, although interestingly, this was never a declared war between either nation. <laughs> With the onset of the Gulf War, the British oh, Army deployed alongside coalition forces. Like other nations operating in the Middle East, a desert camouflage unit. 
it is really crazy seeing the the absolute jump that we're seeing here. So we saw like the Korean War, and then it jumped to so the Korean War was fifties, and then it jumped thirty years, and that was a stark contrast to what we had before. But now, just this is nineteen ninety one, and this is very different from what we saw in the eighties. So it's kind of cool to see the advancement as opposed to you know like the year sixteen hundred versus the year like seventeen hundred. There wasn't that big of a of a difference, you know, besides like the the firearms, I guess. The form was created to blend in better against the arid terrain. The British rifleman was now given an assault rifle, the LA-85A1. Mm -hmm. Although several flaws had been discovered from its service in the sand-dominated environment, these were improved upon when the war in Afghanistan began in 2004. Adopted in 2010, the multi-terrain pattern replaced both the original DPM yes, and sir. desert patterns. In a way, the British Army accomplished what the U.S. <laughs> failed in adapting an effective <laughs> universal camouflage pattern. Yes. During this time, the A3 upgrade <laughs> was applied to the current service rifle to address various flaws and make improvements as the years went on. Good All stuff. soldiers complete their 14-week basic training at Army Training Center Purbright, as well as the necessary skills and trades for their chosen service within the Army. Hmm. For routine ceremonial duties, the British soldier is smartly dressed in a khaki tunic and trousers, with some differences depending on the unit they are serving. Two vibes in addition, for sure. the uniform is augmented with a distinctive peaked cap or beret in traditional colors. For mm. example, in the rifles, the uniform features black buttons versus the more generic brass, oh, a distinct cool. green peaked cap or beret, black belts and straps, as well as distinct regimental insignia adorned on their headgear and belts. All I do like how they're also talking about the distinction between the, the different units, because again, the, the British military has a bunch of different units, just from, I mean, like Wales, Scotland, you know, Northern Ireland, and then England, of course, but even in those specific areas, you have different units that have different, you know, headgear and whatnot. So it's kind of cool. The rifles, though, sounds really badass. Again, just having like some green stuff, the, the black buttons and whatnot, seems pretty, seems like a pretty solid choice. I feel like they get some of the best uniforms, but you guys can correct me on that one. Of course, I'm not talking about the Royal Marines because their uniforms are, are pretty cool, too, I guess ranks wear the same style and cut, although officers are to purchase certain items. <laughs> it would Got be him. a disservice not to mention the most iconic and recognizable uniform of the modern British Army, yep. that of the regiments of the Foot Guards. The distinct scarlet tunic and black bearskin cap are the hallmarks of this uniform, and although a form of bearskin cap has been seen in British service since the 1700s, the current yeah. version dates from after the Battle of Waterloo in 1815, when all ranks of the 1st or Grenadier Regiment of Foot Guards were permitted to wear it as a result of their role in defeating the Imperial Guard in that battle. Okay. In 1831, all regiments of Foot Guards were granted permission to wear the bearskin cap, a tradition awesome. maintained to this so real quick, if you guys are in the guards or if you know anyone who's in the guards, is the bear skin actually like bear fur? I don't know if that's an ignorant, stupid question. It's probably a stupid question, let's be honest. <laughs> I don't know. Was it at some point real bear bear fur, I guess? I'm, I'm sure it was, but I wonder when they sort of made that transition. Because, I mean, again, I saw it in person. It seems like some of the older ones sort of hanged a little bit more in front of their eyes. And it seems like it's not doing that as much, so... I'm not sure how often that thing is actually modernized. So that'd be kind of cool to, to hear about just the, the history of the bearskin cap alone. This day, where it is worn for ceremonial or public duties at various locations, including Buckingham Palace. Hmm. The individual regiments, of which there are five, in seniority, the Grenadier, Coldstream, Scots, seniority, Irish, and huh? Welsh Guards are recognizable by their button placements and plumes in their caps. Mm -hmm. They're not just ceremonial soldiers, and they take their place on operations and deployments around the world. Oh, Equipped yeah. with the standard British service rifle, these scarlet sentries stand silent on post and display a high amount of commitment to their duty to the British royalty. Hmm. Good stuff. All right, hey, fu quick, quick funny story about the, the guards. I was at the Tower of London and, you know, the guards were doing their thing. They had just done a, like a change of command ceremony and I was walking over to the, I wish I had footage of this because it's just so funny. I was walking over to see the crown jewels, of course, like every tourist is supposed to do. And on the left side, they have, you know, the guards standing there, but they also have a door on the left side of the, the hallway as you're going in. And I was walking past and I guess the guard that just did the change of command were sort of like 
you know, still going inside and, and taking off their stuff and whatnot. And there's one, he took off his bearskin cap and he's opening the door trying to get fresh air. So I, I'm walking past and I turn real quick and he sees me and it was just the most awkward eye contact ever. But it was so funny to see like one of the guards, I mean, of course they're regular people, but well, not regular people, but it was funny to just walk past him and see him trying to get like fresh air and whatnot after this, you know, guard shift. I don't know, just a funny story there, but this was a cool video. It's nice, again, it's nice to get like the historical context because again, British history is just very, very extensive, especially compared to the US. So it's kind of cool to see that portion, but again, get you get a really good feel for how combat was just based off of the uniforms because they're like, okay, let's ditch this red stuff because it's not really helping us out too much. And let's go to something that makes a little bit more sense. And then you can also see the weapons modernizing quicker quicker and quicker because like again the, the difference between like the weapons back in the day was not that obvious as it was today so it's kind of cool to see that as well but yeah hopefully you guys enjoy this video but a little bit of a longer video so i will cut it off here so thank you guys for watching again i do have a shorts channel where i post like some gun content and stuff like that some of the more obscure stuff i'll post that over on the shorts channel that's down in the video description so you guys can subscribe to that subscribe to this channel if you want i'd appreciate it but if you like the video you can hit the thumbs up and comment let me know what you think about it but that is it for this one i will see you all in the next one Thank you.